So we managed to smash every goal I've set for the previous parts to the story. So as promised, here is the finale. And if you haven't seen the first two parts, then I would highly recommend watching those videos first. Remember, and if you enjoyed, please leave a comment and maybe even subscribe. Anyway, let's continue from where we left off. Update Tuesday, August 14th, 2018. My conversation with the US Marshals left me speechless. It seemed like every time a question was answered, it created 10 more questions. My Jane Doe was in the witness protection program. Why? Why would she risk her life by coming back here? Who wanted her killed? The US Marshals were extremely professional, polished, and appeared as though they wanted to help. They weren't willing to divulge any specifics or details of why Jane Doe was put into the program, or why she may have been killed. They did tell me that she was a key witness to a very high profile case go involving the ATF. They also admitted that Michelle Klein was her real name. However, they faked her death upon entry of the protection program. Whenever I ran her fingerprints through AFIS, it triggered an alert in their system and that's how they came to be standing in front of me. Before I could ask any questions, they shook my hand and thanked me for my time. They walked out the door before I could even get a why out of my mouth. Who killed Michelle Klein? Who kept calling 911? What did this poor woman get herself into? Why was there a receipt in her pocket from 20 years ago? I finished up the rest of my shift completing paperwork which I eventually faxed over to the suits. I went home early Monday morning and only had two glasses of wine before rolling into bed at 0500 hours. Don't be mistaken, it's not that I didn't want to drink an entire bottle again, but I was just too tired. Monday evening, I headed back towards the station for roll call which started at 1700 hours. Sergeant Oakley read and summarised aloud the prior shift's report before releasing us to hit the road. Before I can finish racking my cruiser, dispatch calls. Dispatch to 1034. 1034, go ahead. 1034, we just got a call from a senior citizen who is currently at her neighbour's house. She is a medical alert customer and oxygen dependent. Our phone lines are currently not working and is requesting to speak with an officer. 1034, show me en route. Although there isn't much for an officer to do on call such as this, we are obligated to respond if someone calls and requests to see an officer. I drive down the long country road towards the collar and can't help but glance it to my right as I pass Patch Lane sign. I arrive on scene and meet with the sweetest old woman who reminded me very much of my own grandmother. She explained to me that she walked to her neighbour's house and called the phone company about her phones not working, but just wanted an officer to keep her company until her phones were fixed since she was oxygen dependent. She also shared that she had already had more than one fall in her home and used her medical alert. I told her I was happy to wait with her. She lived in an old farmhouse, there are many of those in this area, and had one of those prettiest farmlands I've seen in a while. She had her garden filled with colourful flowers and cute lawn ornaments throughout. She caught me staring and said, Oh yes, my daughter comes by every week to help keep my garden looking so pretty. Her husband mows the lawn for me and she tends to my flowers. I was shocked to see the local phone company drive down the gravel road within 30 minutes of my arrival. I went outside to greet the technician and explain the problem. He introduced himself as Tom and asked me where the box was located. As quick as I could repeat the question in my head, I heard the older woman yell from the porch, It's behind the shed. 
I followed Tom behind a shed and about 20 yards away I saw a large 3 foot square pole sticking out of the ground. Tom walked over to it and began reaching on his belt for some tools. What is that? I asked. This is the box that connects our telephone line as well as her neighbour's lines to the central telephone system. I'm going to see if there's a problem with the wires making the connection. He attempts to open the hinge, but no luck. These things usually go months, maybe years without being opened and take a little TLC to open. Ah, there we go. The front face opened after just a little elbow grease was put into it. I saw several wires and some labels next to the wires containing a series of numbers. So explain to me what's going on here, I asked. Well, these boxes were put here way before your time. They had to install these when landlines first became a thing. You see these wires and the numbers after them? They show to which address each wire is associated. I noticed a loose wire hanging from the bottom with no label. And this one appeared to have a female attachment on the end. I asked and, and what is that wire made to connect to? Oh, um, that's there so we can plug our phones into it and make phone calls and test the lines. Wait, what? You can carry a phone in your pocket, plug it in and make a call from a box? Tom laughed and explained. Well, it isn't exactly that simple. You need a certain type of phone, but yeah, I guess it can like that. What phone number would show up when you called someone from a box? Whichever neighbour's line you selected up there, as he motioned to the labels and switches. It was then that I had my light bulb moment. What if my 911 hang ups at Patch Lane were being done at one of these boxes? I asked, so if a house had no electricity, no telephone, could it still show up as the origin of the phone call if someone called from a box? Tom paused for a moment to think about it and responded. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, that's possible. As long as the telephone line has not been resigned to another person. Tom finished up his work and was able to get the phones working again. I left the scene within the hour, so it was still light outside. I decided to head back to the patch lane in the daylight to see if I could find one of these landline telephone poles. I arrived on scene and began walking through. After about 20 minutes, I found it. I leaned over and wrapped my two fingers inside the front panel and pulled. The door opened with ease. Much unlike the last box, I just watched Tom open. Somebody had opened his box recently. But who? As I started to head back towards my cruiser, I heard screaming. God damn it, Haley! I turned around and saw Haley sitting by the front porch. This time she looked in pain. She was holding her front paw in the air and kept licking at it, screaming in pain. I got closer to her and saw that her paw looked incredibly swollen. I am an animal lover, so I decided to wrap her in an old uniform shirt I had in my trunk and set her in my cruiser. I grabbed my phone from the front vest pocket and googled local veterinarians. I was pretty damn surprised to see my family's old vet was showing us still open and in business. We had a black lab growing up that I swear was the most intelligent dog. Dr. Dremers was just down the road and open until 8pm, or 20 hundred hours as I interpreted it. I glanced at my watch and saw it was already 1940. So I rushed down the road to the vet. Dr. Demier immediately took us in and began examining her paw. I couldn't believe this guy was still alive, let alone still working. I remembered him as being old when I was just a kid. He has to be in his 80s by now. My dad used to always take our dog to him and I remember he would call Dr. Demers the mayor because he knew everyone in this town and knew everything about them. For as much as my dog hated the vet, I swear my dad loved going there to shoot the shit with Dr. Dermeers. 
So where did you find this cat, officer? Down on Patch Lane at the abandoned farmhouse. She was sitting on the front porch crying in pain. I just couldn't leave her there. Ah uh, yes, I haven't heard about Patch Lane in quite a while. Oh, are you familiar with that house? I asked. I don't know if I would say that. I just remember the stories that circulated the town way back when. He stopped to write down some notes in the chart. He looked up and said, That was a beautiful farm. I remember taking care of the cows on the old Wentz farm when the goodies lived there. Did you know the guy that lived there after the goodies passed? Oh, I never knew him. I only heard many stories. What stories? Well, that fella was a jack of all trades, you could say. He dipped his hands into just about every illegal scheme you could think of. I heard rumours he had ties to the Mafia. That guy was blonde haired and blue eyed and yet supposedly was Italian. Now, you can explain that to me officer. Never did understand it, but I suspect he was giving something or providing something to them. He's a very odd character. I never heard about the owner of Patch Lane until just now. Where is he now? I asked. Oh, he left town quite a few years ago. Never did see him again. Ah well, anywho. Here's some penicillin you're going to have to give to Haley for the next five days. This will help clear up her abscess to make sure the infection doesn't get any worse. If it does get worse, call my office. Wait, what the hell? I am going to have to give her medicine? So now I have a cat. I am more of a dog person but I can't stomach the idea of dropping her off to the local shelter either. Ugh. On my way home I stopped at local mart and picked up a little litter box. Some cat litter and cat food. At least cats are lower maintenance and more independent than dogs. Haley decided to snuggle up next to me for the night, I'll admit it was the best I slept in months. I woke up Tuesday morning and decided to make it a productive day, despite the fact that it's my day off from work and I'm exhausted. I began to think who would have more information on Patch Lane or Michelle Klein. All of my thoughts came back to the same person, my dad. He was on the force back in the 90s. Hell, he was on the force even back in the 80s and 70s. I drove over to his house and pulled into his driveway. I saw the rose bush in bloom in the front of the house and it instantly reminded me of my mum. She passed away a few years back but every time I go to my dad's, I find pieces of her everywhere. Such as a rose bush that she planted. I welcomed myself inside and I was greeted with the best bear hug. After feeding me and fueling me with his famous super secret recipe coffee, we sat down. Dad, have you ever been to the house in Patch Lane? Oh wow, yes I have, many many years ago. Really? What were you there for? The ATF needed a couple of uniformed officers to assist them with gathering evidence for a case. They busted the owner of that place for smuggling in illegal guns and he had them stored in the shed on the farm. What? I've been researching this place for over a week and I never heard of an ATF raid. Well, that's because it was confidential. We never wrote a police report on the incident. It was solely documented on the federal level and they were very good about keeping it out of the media. We didn't have space phones back then, so it was much easier to keep this under wrap. Do you know what happened to the owner? Who was he? His name was John, uh, no, wait, Joseph, yeah Joseph, um, Joseph Muller, I believe. It was similar to Miller, but not quite Miller. And what happened to him? Right, well, he had an inside mole with the police department and caught wind of the raid. He flew the coup and I never really got an update since then. 
I began to wonder why Tim didn't tell me any of this. Dad, I've been dispatched to Patch Lane several times with Tim and he didn't tell me any of this. Do you know why he wouldn't tell me about it? Well, Tim didn't join the department until about 1997, maybe 98. This all happened around 95, about two years before then. Well, that made me feel a little better. I felt guilty for insinuating that I was questioning Tim. My dad began to ask me questions about my own calls to Patch Lane, but I made the dash to the front door and told him I had to get going because of Haley, and simply told him I had taken in a stray who was still healing. I hadn't heard back from the PA State Lab yet, so I called them to get an update on what was written on the back of the receipt I found in Michelle's pocket. A receptionist answered the phone. State Forensics Department. Hello, this is Officer Barclay, following up on case number 20184114. I want to check the status of my evidence. The receptionist transferred me. A male voice answered. Hello, Officer Barclay. Sorry we've been so busy and I did not get a chance to call you sooner. You were successful in extracting the writing on the back of the receipt you provided to us. It read L34R16L8. What does that even read? I can't say for certain what this means, but, but in my personal opinion, this definitely looks like a combination to a safe. Update Wednesday, August 15th, 2018. I became obsessed with trying to figure out where a safe could possibly be on Patch Lane. I woke up early Tuesday morning and threw some food in my bowl for Haley before racing out to my house. Don't worry Haley, mum will be home later. She meowed goodbye in response, brushed along my leg and trotted over to the couch to curl up and wait for my return. It's so damn hard to leave her now. She's filled a void in my heart I didn't know existed. I headed over to my dad's. I didn't call him ahead of time since he's just down the road and I stop in all the time. As I was pulling up, I saw Tim's truck parked in my dad's driveway. Not very surprised since they're good friends and today is Tim's day off as well. I was actually really glad Tim was there because I had some more questions I wanted to run by him as well. My dad greeted me with his famous bear hug and Tim gave me a nod of the head and smiled. How's it going? Hey, I'm actually really glad you guys are both here. I wanted to ask you both about Patch Lane. Tim chimed in. Jesus, see what I'm talking about? Your girl is obsessed with this case now. Chip off the old block, am I right? My dad laughed. Oh, I remember those days of obsessing over cases. I gotta say, retirement has treated me well. I welcome myself back into the conversation. Okay, well, maybe there is a reason to be obsessed. I just talked to the state's forensic lab and it looks like Michelle had written a code to a safe on the back of that receipt she had in her pocket. I think there's a safe somewhere on Patch Lane and it could have some answers for me. Tim took a long inhale of his cigar, held it and slowly released. You're going to make me go back there, aren't you? I flashed him a smile and offered, well, I could go alone. Tim agreed and my dad laughed at him and remarked, yeah, she does that shit to me too. Tim, good luck with that. I added, Tim, I also wanted to ask you about the 911 hang-ups you used to respond to back when you were a rookie. What else do you remember about the tenant? Tim thought for a moment and replied. Well, she certainly was a pretty young girl. She had two very young children, neither could talk yet, so I bet they were under two. She looked young herself too, I would suspect she was maybe around 20 years old, if that. Just had that baby face, you know? Anywho, she was very curious about the house and the locked door in the basement. Most people hated when the cops showed up, but she always seemed... 
I don't know. Relieved? She would mention how big that house was and how she felt like someone was watching her. Even the tenants after her made similar comments. I always chalked it up to being in the history of that Wentz farm, you know? Tim, is there any chance that the woman we found in the basement was the same girl that lived there? I don't know why it would be. I always thought she moved somewhere else because right after she left, a new tenant came in. I guess I don't know exactly what happened to her. Do you remember her name? Oh god, I am awful with names. I'll never forget the face, but I can't remember names. You know that. That's why I immediately write every person's name down that we interview. I can't even check anywhere since I never took a report for checking her house. Could her name have been Michelle Klein? Honestly, I don't know. It could have, but I have no idea. It was 20 years ago. I turned to my dad. Dad, what do you know about the tenants of that house in the late 90s? He looked nervously down at his cigar and took a short puff. Well, um, I remember all the tenants were similar. What do you mean? They, like, looked similar. Dad, this is important. Just tell me what you're trying to spit out. You took a deep breath. Well, all of the tenants were young, attractive women. They were mostly blonde, from out of town, the type of girls that your mother would not have liked me stopping to talk to at the grocery store if you catch my drift. Wait, are you saying you think they were prostitutes? No, no, I just mean they were young, pretty and kind of ditzy, you know? I wasn't sure what to make of this information, but I let him finish his cigar before we headed into the station. We were scheduled off for Tuesday, but given this new information, I had requested and was granted to come in and work overtime to follow up. I remembered that Tim used to go to the beach and come back with old coins and whatnot that he could find using his metal detector. I asked him if he could bring his metal detector to Patch Lane with him this evening to help us find the safe. After we broke from roll call, we immediately headed to Patch Lane. The scene was done being processed, so we walked through the front door. We went up to the master bedroom and tried every floorboard, every inch of the wall, looking for where a safe could be hidden. We were unsuccessful. We mutually decided to try the basement before the rest of the house. We worked our way into the room where we found Michelle's body. There are some scenes you just won't forget. That was one. Her body was purple, swollen, and unrecognisable as human. The only way I even identify her as a young woman was based on the long blonde hair and the clothing she had on. Tim ran his metal detector along the cement wall and we heard... Tim continued to move it along to the left. We looked at each other for a moment before he dropped his metal detector and we grabbed at the wall. I don't even know what we were grabbing at, but we kept feeling along the wall. As I pushed along the wall, a block moved. I grabbed my knife from my pocket and Tim grabbed his. We both shoved our knives along the cement brick and eased it out from the wall. There it was. The safe. It was an old-fashioned turndial lock, like the kind I used to have on my high school locker. Drawing on my memory, I cleared the lock before trying the combination. I spun it to the left, stopping at 34. Spun it two times to the right, stopping at 16. Spun it back to the left, and stopped at 8. Click. I went to open the door. Tim's eyes and mine locked on the safe, and then I heard another click. But this wasn't like the unlocking of the safe. This was familiar. It was the cocking of a revolver. I turned around and was faced with the barrel of a gun. Well, well, well. You pigs just can't stay away from my house. You had blonde hair, although the grey was taking over and piercing blue eyes. 
You're as bad as that bitch who couldn't keep her mouth shut. You know, I let her live here because she appeared cute and dumb. Our curiosity is what got her killed. Just like what I'm going to do to the two of you. The problem with facing a gun is that no matter how fast I could grab my gun, he would have been able to pull his trigger faster. However, there are other options. I slowly walked towards our killer, hands in the air, leveled with my shoulders and asked, You're Joseph, aren't you? Yeah, and you're dead. As he finished the sentence, my nose was nearly touching the barrel of his gun. I grabbed the barrel, twisting it to his right, making a full 360 degree circle. I heard his pointer finger snap as it got tangled in the trigger and broke. I had the gun and pointed it right back at him. Get on the fucking ground. He slowly raised his hands in the air and got in his right knee, and then his left. Tim ran behind Joseph and placed him in handcuffs. Once the scene under control, we called for backup. As officers arrived on scene, so did the suits. The two suits from earlier in the week came down and Tim and I recounted the evening's events. It was at this point that I realised I still didn't get to see what was inside the safe. I walked over and opened the door. I grabbed a handful of papers and pulled them out. They were photographs. Tim instantly said, That's her. That was the girl. Like I said, I never forget a face. Just names. The suits looked at him and said, That's Michelle Klein. Your body and our witness. I took a deep inhale and released it with a long sigh. Now, can you please tell us what the hell went on here? The suits looked at each other and the older one nodded his head. All right. So your Mr. Joseph Muller here was into some deep stuff. Most predominantly, he ran illegal guns and sold them to some big names including the Mafia. The ATF thought they got everything during the raid years ago. But there are so many hidden passages, tunnels and root cellars throughout this property and land he kept hiding them somewhere new. Trust us, if you knew about the tunnels and passages you are literally standing on right now, you'd have nightmares for years. The suit took a sip of his coffee and continued. He used the tenants as a cover-up and targeted tenants who he thought wouldn't ask any questions and would be fine with sending cheques addressed as cash to a PO box as their monthly rent checks. What he didn't expect was for Michelle Klein to start asking questions and go digging through this house. She stumbled across one of his root cellars where he stored guns and called the feds immediately. She didn't know if she could trust the local police at this point and went straight to the ATF. The ATF contacted us and said they knew Muller and knew that if he found out what she knew then she would be dead. So they sent her to us to protect her. Part of our protection meant that we needed to fake her death so that Muller wouldn't be suspicious and go looking for her. She refused initially, but when we explained to her that her children's lives were at risk too, she agreed. He looked towards the safe and continued. It looks like she used the safe here to store old family photographs and their birth certificates as proof of their existence. We told her she had to leave all of this behind and couldn't take any evidence with her or her previous life or her children. This all happened on October 20th, 1998. It looks like she wrote down the safe code on the first piece of paper she could find and kept it after all these years. We received notification about two weeks ago that her son was diagnosed with cancer. Goddamn cancer. Kid was only 22 years old and had a brain tumour. She kept on telling us she wanted to go see him and we explained to her why it just wasn't possible. And we even told her he probably wouldn't recognise her. It looked like she did her best to try to look as close to how she looked 20 years ago, including her clothing, so that he would recognise her. She probably wanted to grab these photographs to show him to prove that she was his mother and jog his memory. 
When she was here, Joseph must have seen her from one of his tree stands and wanted to silence her. She was one of the only witnesses willing to go forward with her testimony. We just could never catch him after all these years. I responded, Well, I hope the entire case can be closed now. The suits responded, Yeah, I don't think you should be getting any more 911 hang-ups from that house. I processed what they had just said and asked, Yeah, wait, who was the one making those phone calls then? They responded, We can't disclose that information, but you can think of them as a good Samaritan who had eyes everywhere and wanted to see justice done. We headed back to the station, where I started the never-ending paperwork process. Now that we were more secluded, I grabbed one of the suits and decided to tell him about my experience at the medical examiner's office. I began to think he was involved and it was something they needed to know. He stopped me and said, This is actually something that Emmy wanted to talk to you himself about. Hold on. The suit came back with Emmy and he extended his hand to shake mine. I was confused by the gesture but shook his hand. Officer Barclay, I uh, just wanted to say what a fantastic job you did in this case. I also wanted to apologise in person for how I acted and how I handled the case. I received an anonymous threat that if I performed an autopsy or did anything at all with the body, my family was going to be killed. They even knew my daughter's school and her schedule. I am so sorry. I was afraid to go to the authorities out of fear for my family. I am so glad to see that you stuck with your guns and saw this case through. Dispatch interrupted. Dispatch to 1034. 1034, go ahead. Are you able to respond to a 911 hang up? Affirmative. What's the address? Well, thanks for listening all the way through. I can't thank the author of this piece enough and for allowing me to read it to you all. But as always, if you enjoy them, please leave a like to support me and these longer, more time-consuming uploads. Thank you.